Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of No Limits. When you wonder why I'm a little bit more straightforward with the way I said it tonight, I have very good reason to be. I'm pl pleased to be joined by Coach John Bonamago, and Coach Bonamago is a cancer survivor. This is a, a disease I take very seriously, okay? My grandfather died when I was 10 years old at the age of uh, 55, and I was 10. And anytime I hear a cancer story, it makes me ill. It really, really, really does. Well, every time I get an opportunity to bring a cancer survivor on the show, that makes me feel very, very, very good. I had an opportunity recently with the real and the rare to bring on Irma Perone locally here at the Coral Springs Chamber of Commerce. We promoted her book and also talked about it. So tonight's show is what I consider the John Bonamago cancer survivor story. Coach John, John Coach will, and I will go over certain aspects of what he had to do with, and I'm going to let him pretty much take over the broadcast and tell his story. So, folks, uh, we hope you can join us. Before I go any further, though, No Limits is being broadcast around the world. The audio version of the show can be heard on iHeartRadio, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you get your podcast. Please hit the red subscribe button on YouTube, South Florida Tribune. We're striving for a thousand subscribers. Please also comment, like, and share the broadcast. Want to be a guest? One way to do it is just participate in the chat room, or you can send your topic idea to South Florida Tribune at gmail.com. Want to advertise cost efficiently? No problem. Give me a call at 954 304 4941. We broadcast live on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. Our website's www.southfloridatribune.com. Our Twitter is at Tribune South. Candy Ebling is behind the scenes, not only working on the website, but producing the show as well. So, you know, as I said before, this is a show that, you know, we aim to inspire. Yes, we do. And I really like doing different types of shows because it really allows us here at the South Florida Tribune to not be a one-trick pony. I believe in human interest. Anybody that's ever been brought up in journalism should because, you know what, we could write all the game stories we want, but these are the stories what separate the men from the boys, the women from the lady, the girls. And this is a, how we're going to lead into it. Coach, so glad to have you on. Coach Bonamago. Works with me on the Sports Exchange, and he's a regular contributor on Inside the Pigskin. I gave him the week off from Inside the Pigskin so he could tell his story tonight. Glad to have you on, Coach. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. It's great to be here, and uh, you know, good to see you. And uh, I can't. I'm very, very grateful to be able to tell this story because, you know, there's going to. I just want to be able to help somebody. If there's somebody out there that maybe has a relative. Uh, going through something similar or, you know, when we talk about the warning signs, I mean, that was something that I really wasn't educated on. And, and I don't want to say I ignore, ignored them, but I just didn't really understand what was going on until I got that diagnosis. All right. Well, we're going to go over a little bit of thing. I have a feeling on this show, I won't lose my voice because I do a lot of talking, a lot of them, and there are some where I just have to let the guests tell a story. So I guarantee one thing by the end of the night, I will not lose my voice. Anything else I guarantee? Well, for TBD, as we always like to talk about. That's the closest thing you're getting to a laugh tonight. All right, Coach, let's get to it. We talk about squamous cell carcinoma comprises over 95% of oral fairy Nagel cancers. Tobacco and alcohol are major risk factors, but human papillomavirus, HPV, that's good enough. Now cases causes most of these tumors. The symptoms include sore throat and painful and, and or difficult swelling. Why don't you give me an overview on that? Yeah, the HPV virus is one that's very, very prevalent throughout our society. Um, it's one that affects everybody. You're not going to know when you got when you have it. Uh, it's a, you know, similar to like a common cold. And I don't know what the exact st stats are, but it's very, very, very common uh, virus that's transmitted. You know, from from person to person. You can get it from hugging your uncle. Uh, I mean, it's uh, one of those things where it doesn't cause cancer in all people, but in a very small percentage of the population. Uh, it just nicks your DNA, and um, later on in life, it can develop into ca cancer. For me, it was uh, it was in my left tonsil, so a lot of the head and neck cancers is what they're talking about there. 
Uh, it's also the same virus that causes cervical cancer in women. Um, fortunately, it is, you know, we've gotten to the point where it's very treatable. There is a, um, there is a vaccine for those of you who have, uh, you know, pre-adolescent children. Uh, you can get your children vaccinated and then they will never have to worry about getting uh, head and neck cancer or uh, cervical cancer for um, for in females for in the future after they after they get older so it's a uh, it's fairly again it's a common virus but it's a uh, in a in a fairly uh, you know fairly common cancer and unfortunately yeah. yeah. it's one that is uh, not a hundred percent treatable but very treatable okay let's talk about the HPV infections that you indeed just alluded to that are very common. Nearly everyone will get HPV at some point in their lives. More than 42 million Americans are infected with types of HPV that cause disease. About 13 million Americans, including teens, will become infected each year. Why don't you please elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, those are the stats. Like I said, it's it's gonna it's gonna present itself like a common cold. You won't know. You know, I don't have any recollection of when I got it. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, you know, it, there's a lot that's not known about. Um, you know, in terms of when people actually get it at during at during their during their life, but right. uh, you know, those stats are real. Almost everyone is going to contract it at some point or another. Okay, well, let's talk. We're going to go through a few dates that we talked about earlier today. May twenty third, twenty fifteen. You noticed a lump in your neck. So when did you find out about your symptoms? Thumbs. Yeah, um, actually, you know, I had I had taken the job at the, as a head coach at Central Michigan University, which was my alma mater, was my dream job. Uh, started that job in February, uh, I think it was February fifteenth. Uh, you know, and we were actually Paulette and I, my wife, were in Jacksonville because our oldest son was a senior in high school, and we were we were down uh, for his graduation. And it was really like the day after his graduation. I just, I felt a lump on my throat on the left side, uh, right near my tonsil, and it was painful. Now, tumors themselves don't really, uh, don't cause pain. But, you know, with just where it was positioned on my neck, it did, it was, you know, it wasn't excruciating, but it was painful. And, um, you know, kind of brushed it off for, uh you know, first couple days, and then um, you know, not really wasn't getting any better, and so I called uh, called a you know a doctor a friend of mine, and uh, you know I was about ready to go into uh, uh, you know urgent care, and you know he convinced me not to do that, you know just to wait, you know he said give me thirty minutes. It was uh, Doctor Doctor Keating up in Mount Pleasant, and. Uh, and uh, so let me see if I can get you in to see somebody. I was, he was able to get me, you know, to a doctor quickly that same day. And that's really kind of what started the, the whole process. And the thing that a lot of people don't realize is that uh, cancer diagnosis doesn't happen overnight. You know, it's a process of elimination. It takes, takes some time. I had like, a, you know, just a general um appointment i did went through x-rays i had a fine needle biopsy a lot of that stuff was still uh, inconclusive um and it really wasn't until i had my open neck biopsy i don't want to steal your th thunder uh scott but That's on awesome. june on june 7th um i had a four-hour operation where they they went in and um they explained to me ahead of time that they were going to take out as much as that they possibly could um you know, of that, that, that tumor, that lump. Um, uh, but the doctor also said, you know, you have a lot of nerve endings there. There's a lot of, you know, uh, arteries. We're going to get as much as we can send it in for testing. He said, if we don't get it, it doesn't matter because if it comes back and it's cancerous, you're going to have to get, uh, you know, some type of treatment anyways. 
Well, like you said, the early stages of any cancer, let alone this one, are vitally important. You have to go through a process of elimination. Unlike other diseases where you can get them early, this is just not one of those types of situations. Yeah, correct. And, there, you know, there were two warning <laughs> signs that I want to mention, you know, just so people are aware of it, because I really wasn't aware. Um, you know, the first one was, was fatigue, you know, uh, and I'm not talking about just regular tired, like – really, really tired. And, right. you know, I experienced that, but, you know, coming off an NFL season as a, as an assistant coach, um, going through the whole process of interviewing for a head coaching job, taking over a program, I just chalked that up to me, you know, just being tired from my job. Right. Um, the other thing was for me in my case was, was night sweats and night sweats are when you wake up in the middle of the night and you are just, sweating excessively right. um, it's a little bit confusing and and everyone's different in my case it wasn't something that happened every night it was probably i don't know i probably experienced maybe three or four episodes of it um and again i was uh you know we we're moving from detroit we were in temporary housing in in mm -hmm. mount pleasant from temporary housing to moving in you know I, I didn't know if it was, I had messed with the thermostat, you know, what it was. I do remember one time vividly waking up and going, thinking to myself, why am I sweating so badly? So, right. you know, those, those two things, um, you know, are, are very, very important early signs and indicators. And, and, you know, if you're experiencing that, if you have a, a spouse, a loved one, that, you know, don't let those things go unnoticed, the, you know, especially the night sweats, I mean, go get yourself checked out. And when you got the diagnosis on June 14th, you were notified. What was your initial reaction when you did get it? Well, it was, you know, I'm glad you asked that. I mean, um, the funny thing is I was actually in Detroit. I was in the parking lot, uh, of a high school getting ready to go, getting ready to go inside and speak to about 300 uh, high school football players at the Sound Mind, Sound Body football camp. And, um, you know, it took a week to get the biopsy uh, results back. So it was June 14th. Uh, I get the call and, uh, you know, the nurse on the line just said, you know, you, you've you got cancer, you have a squamous, squamous cell carcinoma hpv right. uh you know the oncologist in mount pleasant would like to see you uh as soon as possible i mean i was shocked uh scott i mean those are that's right. you know something that you never really want to hear uh and that i really wouldn't wish on anything anyone um there were a lot of things that were going through my mind honestly the first one was i need to get home and and talk to my wife um the second thing was um, I just had a lot of questions. I didn't know anything about the disease. Uh, didn't know if it was treatable, curable, any of those things. Um, and, you know, the other thing that was on my mind in a big way was, man, um, we had a player at the time uh, at Central Michigan by the name, a young man by the name Derek Nash, who is extremely courageous, who who uh, was going through a battle of himself for, you know, for the third time and eventually, you know, succumbed to that. So wow. a lot of my thoughts were, you know, uh, okay, how am I going to handle this? How am I going to, you know, what am I going to say to my team? You right. know, um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the questions didn't get answered until we got up and spoke to, the physician up in Mount Pleasant. Uh, and then, you know, from there it became, you know, uh, we have to take a course of action. How are we going to release this? You know, um, mm -hmm. I thought we did a really good job, uh, you know, with our athletic director, our, our, our leaderships, uh, you know, up in Mount Pleasant, Dave Hickey, our athletic director, who's yeah. now the athletic director at Arizona, uh, President Ross. I mean, uh, basically, I went uh, back down to Ann Arbor like two or two days later. They, you know, took me in part of a, a clinical trial. Um, 
I had another, you know, small biopsy there. I uh, drove up to Mount Pleasant and filmed the press release, you know, at around 11 o'clock at night. And then the following morning had a, a team meeting. And as soon as, you know, so the, you know, the players on the team, my team could hear it first. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, as soon as that team meeting was over with, they did a press release. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that go through your mind there. You know, you, you think about your family first and, uh, and, and you know, naturally you have a, a million questions that, that you just don't have answers to while you're making that two and a half hour drive back up to, uh, to Mount Pleasant from, from Detroit. Well, how did your team react to the news that you had this? I, I think, um, you know, it was, th they took it well. I mean, my message to them was, you know, again, I wanted to be sensitive to, to Derek and his family. Um, there are a lot of different types of cancers. There, um, there's a lot of different phases for it. I wanted them to know that. Um, and, and basically my message to them was, I had already, you know, by the time I had spoken to them, it was time to speak to them. Right. Uh, I had already made my mind up that I was going to, you know, I was in, I was going to keep coaching. I was going to keep a regular yeah. schedule as much as I possibly could. Um, you know, and look, you know, again, my administration, they offered, you know, uh, you know, they offered, you know, for me to uh, take some time off, step away for a little while. And, you know, I, you know, Paulette knows this, my wife. I mean, I never really ever even entertained that. I had, I had worked my entire career to, to get the opportunity to be a head coach. Um, but even at another deeper level, you know, I felt a sense of responsibility to um, my players and my staff. Um, you know, I think that, that you know, you, you preach things uh, throughout your career and, um, you know, I had a, a group of seniors that were getting ready to play their final year of, of uh, college football. Uh, when you're a leadership, when you're in a leadership position, you know, especially as a head coach, the decisions you make, you know, they affect everybody, you know, yeah. everyone around you. And so I really didn't want to let anybody down and I wasn't going to let this stop me. And my message was, look, you know, I, I will handle this. I will, I'll fight this. Uh, you guys don't need to worry about me. Uh, we have another opponent on our schedule, but it's one that I've got to defeat on my own. Right. And, um, it, you know, it was we, as much as possible. We tried to keep it as, you know, business as usual. Um, you know, the summer was really, really busy because when my treatment started, uh, uh, I decided to go, or we decided to go to University of Michigan Hospital in Ann Arbor. So that's about a two hour and 15, two hour and a half hour drive from Mount Pleasant to Ann Arbor. So uh, the regiment was, you know, was eight weeks of chemotherapy and seven uh, weeks of radiation. The, the chemo I got on Mondays, um, the radiations I got on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So there was you know, seven weeks where we were driving to uh, Ann Arbor and back to, you know, and back to Mount Pleasant, uh, you know, five days a week. And, you know, the radiation, the way it stacks in your body, the first couple of weeks are easy. You don't notice anything. And, right. and then it starts to accumulate. And the way radiation works is it's, it's like, uh, you know, Scott, if I give you a five pound, five pound weight today, right, yeah. and you carry that all around all day long, mm -hmm. and then tomorrow I give you another five pounds, so now you've got ten. After three days, you're going to have fifteen. After four days, you're going to have twenty. You know, after the first week, you've got twenty-five pounds. Right. In two weeks, you're going to have fifty. Three weeks, you're going to have seventy-five. Four. So that's how it stacks up. And then when you're done with it, it leaves your body, you know, it leaves your body at the same rate. So the, the symptoms don't actually come on all at once. They gradually occur. And, you know, I don't want to spend the whole talk, the whole show about that. But, 
you know, in short, um, I had to get a feeding tube because I couldn't swallow anything really. Uh, you lose your sense of taste. Um, I lost a total of 75 pounds, you know, which okay. was, was nuts. Um, but you know, that was the, uh, that was the regiment. So that went from, you know, June 29th to August 21st. So that was, you know, through the first part of training camp, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, fortunately for me as the head coach, I was the guy that, that made the schedule. So, mm -hmm. uh, I always had that, you know, I had the first, uh, appointment slot at the, at the oncology center in the radi radiation, radiation oncology center at Michigan. That was at 7 AM. So I was, I was there every morning at 7 AM and I would get my Saturday, Saturday and Sunday off to recuperate a little bit. Well, you know, you mentioned this and I'm going to reiterate on it for a moment, coach. Okay. That I really am really am proud of you for knowing that you could have had an interim coach step in your place, but you chose to set a good example for your students because I call players at that level students first because they call it the student athlete and you kept on coaching. And you know what? I cannot give any higher praise than I am able to do, let alone anybody that's watching this or will watch it down the line. I mean, that, that's incredible. A lot of coaches know they could, but you just kept battling. And you know what? That That's an inspiration, not only to players, but just anybody in general. I mean, well, keep on coaching, and, that, and that's what you did. Well, I appreciate that, yeah. and I was very, very fortunate, and it wasn't, you know, I wasn't by myself. Uh, right. th thank you, George, for your comment there. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I was, for I had, you know, the players were super supportive. I get, obviously, the administration was supportive. Uh, I had a great staff. Those guys really, you know, stepped up, and, uh, you know, <laughs> I have the best support system at home and, and my wife who, you know, uh, you know, held my hand every night when I fell asleep, when I had to sleep propped up because if I, uh, you know, if I laid down completely flat, I probably would have drowned in my own mucus as, right. as, as gross as that is. That's, you know, just part, part of the, uh, part of the deal. But, um, I think one of the things also a big part for me, and I've been asked this before is, was, you know, people say, you know, do you appreciate things? Do you appreciate life more? Um, I, I don't ever think that I ever was that person that took things for granted, but I do think what it does is it changes your perspective on things, you know, um, you know, when you're going through something, another trial, another tribulation or something, um, you know, I kind of go back and say, well, this might be tough. Uh, this stinks, but it's not, it's nothing compared to, you know, what I went through. The, the other part and, and perspective is so important. And every single day when I would go down there to Michigan, man, I felt really, really lucky. I really did. Uh, you know, because like I said, we ended up losing Derek Nash, you know, right. uh, we, we ended up having to, you know, to bury him. And, uh, you know, I just learned a lot of lessons, um, you know, that this, the disease doesn't discriminate. You know, I saw all people from all different walks of life, all different ages, and a lot of them were far worse off than I was. And, and your heart really goes out to them. And, you know, so just, you know, if there was one lesson, one big lesson, it was, you know, always keep things in perspective and, uh, you know, find your, your, the people that, that, that are important to you, just, you know, keep them close and hang on. And, uh, you know, those were, those were just really, you know, really important deals. The other thing I would say is, you know, um, don't forget that if you have somebody, a loved one or whatever, you know, a friend or what, don't forget about the families. You know, there was a lot of support for me and, and there was a good amount of support for my family. But, you know, I felt like, um, you know, they, they were such a big part of it. And, you know, your your children, your kids, they, you know, they range from senior in high school to freshman in high school to, you know, sixth grade their understanding of it is is different you know so it just um 
always keep that family in in mind too if if you know somebody that's going through there because it, tr trust me it's it's uh it's just as tough on on them you know a lot of the a lot of the tension a lot of the focus is on the individual because of the treatments and that sort of thing but right. man don't don't forget about those families too they need your support as well Okay, I find it interesting. I don't want to say ironic because we plan these shows when we do and dates sometime come into, they happen to work out and this one really did <clears throat> because you indicated that, you know, you were diagnosed on what, June 14th and here we are doing this broadcast mm -hmm. on June 15th. Yeah. I mean, so let's have a little, there is a way we can have a little bit of fun here and this is right. probably the window that we can do it. Okay, yeah. so what do you think? We're doing this on June 15th. You were diagnosed on June 14th. Give me a little perspective on that. Well, you know, I'm still here. That's the best perspective I can give you. And I know maybe that's not, you know, um, I'm still here. And and really it was it was Paulette, it was my wife that that right. uh when we were on the phone yesterday, she goes, yeah, John, right. you realize it was June 14th when you got your your diagnosis. And I'm like, Yeah, that's that's right. You know, the the better one was, you know, the you know, about in November, it was mid-November, I think it was right around Thanksgiving yeah. um, when that when I got the all clear. You know, that's yeah. that's the one that, that that's really important. Well, let's have a little bit more fun on dates because when I had major back surgery at Holy Cross in Fort Lauderdale, I and I was in there on morphine. That was my favorite drug. Oh, you talk about candy other than the one I married. That was a good drug back then, but the amazing part about that, now, and this, I was going through a severe back, a herniated disc with the L4, L5. Well, get this, Michael Jackson and Farrah Fawcett died on the same day. Oh, man. Operation. Now, here's the intriguing part about this, Coach, okay? Every time I need to look up my operation, all I need to do is look up Michael Jackson and Farrah yeah. Fawcett. Oh, hey, by the way, you know, on my medical reg, and if that isn't interesting, okay, if I want to look up Billy Martin's death, I tore my ankle on Magic Mountain in Vermont. I just look up, oh, that's when I busted up my ankle. So say what we want about days, but, you know, if, if there's any kind of thing that happens for a reason, and I'm going to mention Billy Martin, you know, Michael Jackson and Vera Fawcett, that's when a couple of my major situations occurred. So, I mean... And yet, ironically, you know, you found out the day before we're going. Sure. Right. So with that said, <coughs> when you got the cancer diagnosis, and we talk about cancer. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. So let me try again. When you got the cancer diagnosis, what's going on you, in your head? You feel it's like, do people react like this is a death sentence now? You know, because traumatically, psychologically, I got cancer. I only have so much time to live. Is that the initial reaction that you get? I think it, I think it is from a lot of people that don't know you. If you don't have the opportunity to explain it to them, um, you know, I, you know, I'm pretty stubborn and hard headed. I, I right. wasn't. I never really thought of it that way. I never. Uh, I mean, obviously, maybe it's in the way back recesses of your mind, but uh, I personally never allowed myself to and and paulette would never allow me to turn turn flip that coin over to look on the what was on the other side you know it was we were focusing on just you know really you know one day at a time i mean you know obviously you know you're you're getting into to training camp you know football i think was a, a great diversion for me um it was challenging because I would lose my voice really, really easy. You imagine, you know, it's like having strep throat for whatever, three months, right? Um, but yeah, I think your attitude is 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 really, truly the most important thing because you, you none of us, we can't control the circumstances right. that happen in our lives. We're all going to go through things, but what you can control is how you react to them. And right. You know, if you let the diagnosis beat you, then you're done, right? So it, to me, I really approached it like a game. It's like it was an opponent. I was going to get this out of me you know, at, at whatever cost. And um, again, you know, I'm, I'm biased, but there's there wasn't there's isn't a better hospital 
in the in the in America that I could have been at. Uh, or in the world that I could have been at than U of M Hospital. I mean, uh, Dr. Spector, uh, Matt Spector was my, you know, he's the he's the head and neck cancer specialist there. I mean, he was phenomenal, just absolutely phenomenal in every sense of the way. And so uh, when you're, when you have something and you're going to go, you know, you're going to go to battle against something. You want to know that you have the very best team on your side. And I really felt confident in that. That gave me, that, you know, that gave me a tremendous amount of confidence that I was going to, you know, I was just going to beat this and that it was going to be something in, in my history. But I also knew like, man, there's got to be a reason. Uh, it was overwhelming the number of people that reached out, um, complete strangers. Um, you know, there were several people that had gone through the same exact cancer that, that reached out. And, you know, what I've only, I've just tried to, to pay it forward or pay it back whenever I can. Anytime I've heard of it. I mean, ironically, I've gotten I didn't really know Ron Rivera, uh, but Coach Rivera, when he went through his deal a couple of years back, it was the same exact thing. And uh, I was able to hop on the phone with him because it, it was such a big advantage to me to, you know, to have had spoken to people who had gone through the same thing. So, yeah, I got to, you know, you have a little bit of an idea of, you know, what to expect. You know, I mean, you know, it's going to be tough going into it. It's not going to you're not going to be comfortable. There's nothing fun. There's nothing easy about, you know, you know, radiation or, or chemotherapy. It it sucks. It really does. But um Again, it, it's it's all about your attitude and, and your in your mindset. Hey, Brian, thanks for tuning in tonight. You know, it's amazing. You talk about Dr. Matt Spector. I'm gonna have to Google him up a little bit. My mom He's ended up having a stud. <laughs> What's that? He's an absolute stud. Yeah, I'm gonna Google him up. I'd like a little bit more information about him. You never know if I may invite him to come on one day to now and follow your lead. Anything's possible with me, you know that right now. Sure. <laughs> but here's the thing. My mom went to the University of Michigan Hospital as well, and she was dealing with some serious COPD. I think they may have caught it a little too late. There wasn't much that they could do. But, you know, I've heard a lot of great things about University of Michigan Hospital. Me, when I had my major throat, I had a re major reconstruction. I had to get mine done at the Mayo Clinic. Ken. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? I've never been to University of Michigan Hospital. I've heard nothing but good things about it. But me personally... I've Mayo Clinic is a place that I've always felt comfortable with because they have locations near Jacksonville out in Arizona. And of course, a big one out in, in Rochester, Minnesota. So, but mm -hmm. no, I'm glad. I mean, you know, amazingly enough, though, here you are having to take a two and a half hour drive. And then you probably never dawned on you to go ahead and play YouTube music on there. Or do you, are you a big believer in meditation? Um, yes, I am. Uh, am I a huge practicer of it? No, I think that, uh, you know, to, I'm a big pressure, big, uh, proponent of effective thinking and visualization. I think that and, and, you know, meditation fall very, very, very closely, you know, hand in hand, uh, you know, as far as making the trip, you know, down to Ann Arbor and back every day for, you know, five days a week for, for seven weeks, uh, you know, th that is, you know, when you're the head coach, you, you have, yeah. you know, head coach privileges. So, mm -hmm. you know, luckily I wasn't driving myself. I had to, you know, I set up a schedule. I, I had the GAs picking me up, you know, oh, wow. I had my wow. graduate assistants that was, you know, <laughs> they would, you know, they'd that pick is. me up at like, you know, you know, four forty-five in the morning and, uh, we'd make the, make the ride. So that's what. So you're telling me, being a head coach, you have those little extra privileges. Where you graduate <laughs> yeah, there's no but question. Life, I really, really feel bad. At least I didn't have to drive myself. Yeah. So, so you take a wheel away from me, two and a half, three hours, and I'm driving crazy. Everybody's gonna think I'm gonna lose it. <laughs> I'm a, you talk to my wife, Candy. She'll tell you right now that if he's healthy, he's dangerous. And I, mean, I don't know if we have any cops out there listening. Don't worry. I do the best I can to stay, play it straight because I'm not looking to finance your city. Yeah, I want to get well, it. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a funny story. Is you know my 
my office at Central was right across the hallway from like the team meeting room. And uh, I had a, a pick line in inserted in my in my left arm which a pick line for people out there that don't know they they it runs through it they they take it all the way up to your heart you know because the thing that that happens is you end up you end up getting blood test after blood test after blood test after blood test they're all every day they're they're drawing blood from you and you know you're not eating you, you, because you can't you're you're on a liquid diet you're losing weight, you're emaciated. After a while, it's like, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to find a spot on your arm to to draw blood. So they did, they put a pick line in. Well, the good thing about that is that one of the other benefits was they would be able to hook me up to an IV. So I was taking, you know, two to three liters of, of fluid every day in between practices. Um, so I wouldn't, so that I wouldn't dehydrate, right? Because that would have just made things worse. So this one particular day during camp, it's like I can't locate the trainer. You know, I'm calling the trainer, like he's got to come take this thing out of my arm. I can't find him, and you know, my meeting's getting ready to start in two minutes. So I'm not going to be late for the meeting. You know, that's it's unacceptable for anybody. You know, you especially if you're the one running it, you're the head coach. It doesn't set a very good precedent. So I just took the, you know, the IV stand in with me into the meeting and went about my business. I told the guys, look, it's just, you know, fluid. Don't, don't, not a big deal. It's not. So I, I'm going through my, my meeting and the, you know, the IV bags probably flopping around like a puppet. Well, when the IV's done, right, it works by gravity. By the time we're done with the meeting, the the eyes and the and the the players, their eyeballs. I didn't realize it, but mm-hmm. after the fluid emptied out, well, it started to go back up, and it was it was starting to fill up with blood. Yeah. <laughs> not awesome. a, not a lot, not a, you know, it wasn't All right, but but it was still you know it was. I find it funny at, at this time you know, that, that that happened, but. Uh, Hey, listen, if you could make light out of that situation, I told you, you got a free form to say whatever you want, you can do it. The only thing I'm going to add to that is this. And everybody associated with medical, bodies weren't made to be treated like dartboards, okay? They're not. True. <clears throat> but True. unfortunately, the reality in medicine, modern or prehistoric, is dartboard 101, okay? Yep. And that's that. We don't want to sit here and get too creative with the visualization, but right. hey, you know what? It's, you know, this is an opportunity for you to tell your story, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And yes. and if we want to incorporate that story, go ahead and do it. So, all right, let's talk a little bit about the treatment program that you were involved in. I know you touched on it, Coach, okay? Mm-hmm. But now is an opportunity, if you feel like it, is to get a little bit more specific about what you had to do. And then we're going to talk about another fatality in a little while. But uh, let's I just want to go through the actual chronological order. Uh, we talked about the June 29th, you know, date. Well, I don't so let's talk about the significance of that June 29th date, and then we're going to talk about some treatment as well. Yeah, June 29th is when I got my first chemo, uh first okay. round of chemo. Um, you know. That amounts to basically you're sitting in a room with, you know, a lot of other people and you're just connected to an IV and it, mine usually took about two, two hours or so. Yeah. And um, you're just sitting there and then, you know, the following week we started the, the radiation. Uh, the radiation really doesn't take that long. I mean, but to let you know the scope of this, um, at Michigan at the time, these, uh, these radiation machines, they had six of them. Um, and I think they're, they're 20 million a piece. That's how much they cost. You know, the, the walls, the walls are, you know, they're six feet of steel. You're in there by yourself. You're, you're strapped down to a board. They make you like a, a custom mask that, that, and you know they literally screw you down to so you cannot move and this thing goes around your head and it it 
it zaps you with radiation from different angles, which is part of the technology that enables you to, uh, you know, they want to, the, the big side effect with a lot of people that have gone through this in previous, you know, previous generations was the radiation would kill off your saliva uh, right. uh, glands. And so um, by rotating it, they are able to preserve a lot of that. And uh, okay. you're still going to lose some of it, but the uh, the theory is that the ones that are preserved can make up the difference for the for those. So there's times where I still get like you know dry mouth if I talk too long. But man, I'm 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 fortunate, and it's it's nothing that I can't live with and and deal with. And, and again, very very lucky. But yeah, the radiation only takes about by the time you're there, you know you're in and out in 15 20 minutes. But to really? give you an idea of the scope of people that they're treating, you know, those things are booked solid, you know, on 15 minute increments from really? seven, seven o'clock in the morning until, you know, seven or eight o'clock in the evening. And that's how many people are going through there on a daily basis. I imagine that's where your graduate assistants were a real big help there, weren't they? Yeah, I mean, just try, yeah, getting yeah. me one. Yep. Yeah, I get dry mouth because I talk too much. But then again, <laughs> it's something you're surprised anyways. I don't know. But, uh, all right, so let's talk about the fact that, you know, if it's caught early, you're okay. But if it's not, it's fatal. Let's talk about the Hillsdale story, if you don't mind. Yeah, a good friend of mine, Pat Reepma, um, was the head coach at Hillsdale College um, and was battling the same cancer for the second time. Um, when I was diagnosed and eventually succumbed to it. Um, the first time, you know, he, he was able to, they caught it, they, he was able to get treatment. And then almost five years to the day, it, it, yeah. it came back. And, really? you know, that's why when, when you, when you finish your, you know, when you get the all clear, all clear uh, stamp of approval, uh, technically, you're in, in remission. So the American Cancer Society has a window of five years. You're in remission for five years until uh, you're officially declared, you know, cancer, you're, you're cancer free or, you know, cured. After, after the five year mark, the, the incidence of it or any really any cancer returning is, is vastly diminishes almost to nil, you know, but, you know, so after the treatment, you know, I'm, you're, you're, you're cancer free, but you're technically in remission uh, till you hit that five year mark. So, you know, the first year you're still going in for a monthly checkup and then it goes down after year two and three, you're maybe going every three months, uh, year four and five, it's a, a six month uh, checkup and, after year five now, I don't, I never have to go back. Wow. Good story. Unfortunately, for the coach at Hillsdale College, it didn't yeah. really happen that way. And, and Coach Reepmo was, was a great guy, great mentor. He was a graduate assistant at Central Michigan when I was a player. Um, you know, he was a Hillsdale grad and, and just a really, you know, really great man. It was, a, it was tough losing him. Yeah. How old was he when he passed on? Well, he was older than I am, so I'm going to guess he was in his, you know, mid-50s. Okay. Just All right. I want to ask, is there anything else you want to talk about this? I mean, the floor is yours to so say whatever you want. I just want um, to make sure we got a lot of the particulars all the way first. Yeah, I, again, I mean, I just go back to, to the lessons learned. You know, the first one I would say is, you know, uh, adversity cancer doesn't discriminate you know right. it, it affects everybody i mean um you know that was the hardest part i think going there every day was we're seeing the young kids and just really the amount of empathy you need want to have for the, the not just the child but the family um yeah. the second one you know lesson two is you know in life you find your rock and hang on you know find your support system for for me, it's my wife, you know, I, you know, she was, she was a rock star, but not, no pun intended, but she, no, you know, it was, uh, find your rock and hang on, you know, the next, 
the next thing I would say is, um, you know, I said it before is you, you, you know, you'll never be able to, cons you know, to, you'll never be able to completely control the circumstances that occur in your life. But what you can control is how you react to them. So your attitude in all things is, is really the most important thing, you know, find a reason, uh, to look forward, find the positive in any situation that you're, you know, that you're dealing with because uh, 10% of, of life is what happens to you. And 90% of it's how you react to it. That's just, those are facts. I just really believe that that, um, the, and then, you know, the last thing is, like I said, you know, the adversity, you know, uh, or excuse me, just perspective and adversity and perspective to me go hand in hand. It's like, no matter what you're dealing with, there's going to be somebody out there that's worse off than you are. You know, it's just, right. you know, it, to my, today might be a bad day, but man, tomorrow's going to be better. And even though today was bad, it's not as bad as, you know, maybe what happened back then. So, you know, just try to keep a perspective on thing because there's, you know, there's always one more game, one more play, you know, uh, one more, you know, one more opportunity somewhere on the horizon. And so just, you know, keep it all in perspective. That's, uh, you know, that's really the most important things. And that's, that's my message. And, you know, have empathy for those people, um, have empathy for their family. That's the best way that you can show support and just remember those warning signs. And, and if you experience something, you know, don't ignore it. Don't blow it off. Go, you know, go get it checked out because obviously 100% what you said, early diagnosis is the biggest factor in, in, uh, in beating it. I was, I was fortunate, you know, I was fortunate that number one, we caught it early. Number two, it was very treatable. Uh, number three, I had a great support system around me. Number four, um, I, you know, I had an unbelievable team of medical people and uh you know we were able to we were able to beat it you know it's not easy um it wasn't easy uh but i mean if i can do it anybody can great story you know ironically i was talking to my aunt nancy specker today i was telling her about my concussion issues where i have second impacts you know second impacts uh, symptoms, I think it's what they call it anyways. And she's trying to advise me to get the Botox. I have one scheduled right now. The insurance is getting in the way. Hopefully we ultimately get it. Yeah. But she was telling me just if there, there's ways that they'll get it to you if you write them a nice letter. And I told her, you know, I really enjoy branching off to not only do sports stuff, but off different things. And, and yet here I am. But, uh, but by the way, she's not related to Dr. Matt Specter, or if I, or she is, I don't know about it yet. Who knows? But Specter, Breed Specter. I mean, when you have a common name, you have a common name. Uh, and I have a feeling at some point she'll probably watch the show because I told her I was really been looking forward to doing your show for a long time, doing this thing after we touched base on a couple of things and the timing couldn't work out. But you are right, though. You know, you talk about a soul, a significant other soulmate. My wife, Candy, has been with me 10 years, and she's probably seen just about every hospital in South Florida with the way I've been getting banged up. And she just, you know, she, the only thing she has in common with Aaron Rodgers is she does relax, okay? And you, when we were, before we were married, I was having some major, major problems. Just stood there and said, yeah, you know, Candy, you know, I, I can see the outside. You know, I, I don't like to tell her story too much, but she was involved with the guy before she was with me unfortunately he passed away in that very hospital so then she wheels me out so well you know people can't leave jfk hospital out in lake worth out in lake worth or wherever alive and i'm just one of those things well you know i told her let's get over the beach i didn't really like the view from the hospital but it stunk and that's what my mother was calling me a future mother-in-law was calling me three times a week but please tell your wife that oh, Candy and I are looking forward to catching up with you and you and I, we got tons of stuff to do anyways. But, yeah, anyway. yeah, but you know, hey, you're right. You got to have a soulmate. I, I mean, you know, I always tell people when they talk about my wife, she's a different bird. She probably deserves a gold medal bigger than the one they get at the Olympics for dealing with me on a lot of different fronts. <clears throat> but I told my aunt, Nancy Spector, on a candid note, no matter what happens to me, 
when it's, when it's all said and done, I say, you know what? You'll always know what I sound like. You'll always know what I look like. All you need to do, Candy, is go to YouTube, okay? And that's that. And then you'll know what, you know, you know, when you hear somebody passes on, you may not have enough tape to know what they sound or look like, but we got it here. You don't have to use me as one of those, get up, get up. And they have a ringtone made after me, but, you know, well, well let's take that off of me and keep the focus on you. It's just some ironic synergy here that with you have a strong, significant other like I do, then to me that's important because you know what? You always feel, Coach, that you're not in the battle alone. And no there's question. Nothing, yeah, there's yeah. nothing more powerful than to know you have somebody right by your side. Well, well okay. said. Yeah. Well said. Yeah, and – I'm looking forward to meeting your wife, huh? but you and me, we're going to be doing some remote stuff. All this streaming is all well. Up. We got to talk about today. I'm glad. You know, I got to tell you a funny story, though. And I always used to joke around with my mom, but she always used to take it the wrong way because she was a flamboyant individual. God love her. Okay. She taught me a lot of things about creativity. But mom, here's the deal. Okay, and, I, and you want to talk about a poker face could really get into somebody's head. Uh, and there's things about poker faces and communication that you ought to know. You're a head coach and a regular coach, right? But, you know, when my mom had numerous cancer scares and health problems, you know what the problem I told my mom? And I'm giving her the most serious face, like it looks like I'm demeaning her. You know, Ma, I hate to tell you this, okay? But God doesn't want you and the devil won't take it. She said, well, wait a minute, I didn't. And then it took a little while to process this. Mom, you don't even understand. That's the biggest compliment. You, you didn't even go out there and figure out. If they don't want the devil won't take you, okay? Then it means you get to live. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm telling you. So, folks, if you ever want a line, you heard it here on the South Florida Tribune broadcasting that way whether it's your mom dad or whoever god doesn't want you and the devil won't take it because that means equals l-i-v-e live all right so i'm glad we, <laughs> i had to get that one out here because i know that we do take cancer seriously we really do and there's a i know if it happens with me well you know what i'll deal with it like you i'll just be i'll take care of it head on and do the best I can. But everybody, our goal here, Coach, as we know, is to inspire and educate and inform. And I think that every time I put a broadcast together, those are my top three priorities when I'm doing this stuff. And, you know, it's just it's one of those type of things that we have a job to do. We have to maintain our professionalism. We have to know when to use home humor. And then there are times we have to be serious about things. So you have to be a chameleon in the way you approach anything that you do. I imagine you coach the same way too, right? You know, sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you got to lean on people. You but need the, the full spectrum of your personality to right. get through to, to, you know, to get through to your audience. You know, I think that's uh, – it's really important in coaching. I mean, it's important. You, you, you have, uh, if you have a hundred players on a team, you got a hundred personalities. Every one of them are different, you know. And it's, you know, you are a team, you know, but but still, it's like you have to know, you know, you have to know as a coach what makes the individual tick. Right. Well, one of my long-term goals to coach is to be able to do public speaking, and I'm looking forward to doing that when the situation presents itself. I like taking a index card with just a bunch of things on there and my own bad chicken scratch. Okay, every once in a while, if I if my neuropathy doesn't kick in, or long before I had this stupid stuff, anyways, I used to write it on there and I used to have bullet points. You know, one, one, two, and then I go in front of a mirror and boom, there you go. That's your speech. Everybody's looking like. We got just eight and a half by 11. We got to read it uh, like a monotone robot. No, I don't have anything but a darn robot, man. I just put it out there. Let's go out there and, you know, but we, you know, it's those types of things where you have to be able to incorporate what you do. And I think the one thing I could close the show on, though, is I'll tell you right now, you working at Central Michigan, coaching under those adverse circumstances, what you were able to do with your student athlete was, you know what? I would, I'm in a tough situation right now, but I'm going to fight, and I expect you to do the same. So if you talk about the ultimate cliche, let's turn a negative into a positive, I think that's probably the one thing that the message you were looking to aim towards your students, wasn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's times that, you know, you you have to put up or shut up. You're going to, you know, if, you, if you're going to talk the talk, you have to walk the walk. Um, but, again, for me, it was uh, – it wasn't even, there wasn't even a decision to be made. You know, it was about, you know, I didn't want to, 
I didn't want to let anybody down, you know, for this, you know, again, you have a lot of people depending on you when you're, when you're, uh, when you're in that position, you know, your decisions affect everybody. Right. Well, I mean, like anything else, you know what? Ernie Harwell once taught me a little thing of the time. If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Yep. I'll tell you what, though, with cancer, you can't get out of the kitchen. You have to stay in the heat because it's a matter of survival at that point. Yep. But, you know, I'm glad that we had a chance to tell your story. Let me go out there and in case you didn't hear it the first time, No Limits is being broadcast around the world. Now, the audio version of No Limits can be heard on iHeartRadio, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you get your podcast. Please hit the red subscribe button on YouTube, South Florida Tribune. We're striving for 1,000 subscribers. Please also comment, like, and share the broadcast. Want to be a guest? No problem. Give me a, uh, uh, send your topic ideas to South Florida Tribune at gmail.com or you participate in the chat room. If you want to advertise cost efficiently, no problem. Give me a call 954 304 4941. We broadcast live on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. Our website's www.southfloridatribune.com. Our Twitter information is at Tribune South. And Candy Ebling, as usual, does a magnificent job working behind the scenes. She really does. What she does to get all of our shows up there, the construction of the website building it from the ground up from scratch i mean she's just a marvel and more importantly if you if there's a the way i look at it when it comes to putting somebody on a high pedal so she definitely deserves it and i'm sure you feel the same way about sure your you know, another so you know what folks i really enjoyed doing this edition of no limits i enjoy doing a lot of them anyways but sometimes when you run across a cancer survivor a guy that you care about and we worked together before and now you and i have a chance to do stuff here in the media together which is even better because that means we get to stay in touch more and you get to go ahead and take all my other stuff when it's serious but this is one of those kinds of things here okay to me that hits closer to home and i'm glad coach tonight you had the opportunity to tell your story because i'll tell you what like you say whether you go to a seminar or whether you go to a public speech or anything, if you can inspire one individual, okay, then you've gotten your job done. And that's it's so, so important. And that's what we're striving to do. And I'm just so glad that you and I had an opportunity to use a day after your diagnosis to tell what we call the John Bonamago cancer surviving story. Folk, that's how we typed it. And that's exactly what I'm really proud to do. And, you know, coach to me, uh, you're my hero. You really, really, really are. And uh, <laughs> oh, no, it's the truth. You are my Thank hero. You. I appreciate you're that. Friend. You're a great friend and colleague, but you're my hero. And as I said before, you know, we want to, uh, our goal here when we do this sort of thing is we want to inspire people and motivate them where, you know, you think things are bad in our lifetime, go to, to foreign countries or they're homeless and they aren't fed well. And I know that's a tough situation for them, and I don't totally respect it a bazillion percent. But we're focusing on the present. I'm just glad that you've, you're you able to enjoy retirement in the state of Florida and that your coaching career was well-defined, as we talked about in your first show with us. And But we got more to do, don't we? Sure do. Sure do. Um, thanks, Scott, for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to tell the story. Uh, thank you to all the people. We didn't get to all the comments, but I appreciate those. And, uh, you know, just to, as a final thing before we sign off again, just know the warning signs, you know, get help and, and keep things, keep it positive, keep it in perspective, everybody. Thank you. All right, so this concludes this edition of No Limits. My name is Scott Morgan, Roth Motor City, Manmouth. Pleased to be joined by Coach John Amago. John Bonamago, this is an opportunity for Coach to tell his story, and I hope that you're able to get as much out of this episode as much as we enjoy putting it together and getting it out there for everybody else. So once again, folks, on behalf of Coach John Bonamago, my name is Scott Morganroth, the Motor City Madmouth. Thank you for joining us on this, on this edition of No Limits. And you know what? We're going to have Coach back on talking football next week, but we gave him a break this time. But now we're going to get back and talk some gridiron real soon. So good night, everybody. And once again, thank you for joining us.